thank you for the invitation. Uh, before I'm going to say something about the project Landscape House, I would like to give a brief introduction. Um, the company name Universe Architecture was um, thought of as an um, sort of to portray the ambition uh, to uh, connect the virtual and the physical, and also to connect the small and the big. As we all have uh, a private universe, there's also the, the universe uh, around us with uh, specific features. Um, recently, at Universe Architecture, we discovered that all projects basically have a recipe for discovery. Um, it follows a very simple path of question-answer discovery. Um, and at best, the, qu the question and the answer um, are about, so to speak, a truth. A truth that is uh, counting for all of us. And the discovery, at best, is a design or uh, an outcome that, that shows um, in a unique way what the truth is, basically. Um, I want to show you two, two projects uh, briefly. Um, this project is called Floating Bed and started in, in the year 2000 when I um, graduated as an architect and was sitting next to my father in, in, uh, in the car on the highway and asked him, he's also an architect, a uh, renowned architect, Hans Ruysenaars, um, and I asked him what binds all architects, what makes them the same instead of different. Um, and after being quiet for a minute, um, he said, uh, it's gravity because gravity is, um, is dictating the way uh, the built world around us looks, uh, what, the, what this world looks like, because um, roofs are tilted so the water can fall down, uh, wheels of a car are underneath, it's very obvious stuff, but it's, it's so omnipresent that it influences the way architecture uh, uh, is being built. So as a young architect, of course, you look for a new way or, or for a new artifact uh, in which this is not the case for the first time. So we succeeded with um, uh, magnets underneath the floor and magnets in the bed. Uh, repulsion pushes them away and, and it's an instable power, so four cables need to stabilize the product. Um, in 2006 it was uh, published. Um, this image traveled uh, quite well. Time magazine elected it best invention uh, of the year amongst uh, other, other companies. Uh, Oprah Winfrey called and asked if we could come to Chicago with the bed and, and have an interview on, on the edge of the bed, but at this stage we only made something like this big, so this was not a good idea. Um, but it's an important moment uh, to go public and have, have this image travel, because the, po the, the project I'm going to show is basically at this point uh, what I'm talking about uh, as, as in the floating bed. And this year, um, we might produce it for a large uh, German company, actually. So these projects take time. Uh, real short, uh, another project where we asked the question if we could improve density. Something architects uh, face this question, uh, many architects face this question in, in, in dense city areas. And uh, we succeeded, actually, by improving the quality instead of uh, decreasing the quality. Uh, the corner apartment that you look at uh, has like the, the ground floor, then a first floor and a top floor. And every apartment, it's sort of a Tetris house. So every house has a free north, east, south, west view, uh, connection to the water and a rooftop terrace. Uh, so we like to use this on, uh, on the water or on, on the top of buildings in, in dense areas. Uh, the landscape house started in 2008 with a competition where we were asked to make housing in this beautiful landscape and we said we don't want this traditional type of housing and asked the question can you make a building like the landscape um, and the landscape of course has uh, different surfaces but if you zoom out um, and, and look at the landscape from a f from a further distance there is continuity, there's no beginning or end in, in Earth. So we took this question, or this answer actually, to the level of building by bending a little paper, which could be the, um, the beginning of a building, of, of a surface or a floor. Um, we came up, um, or, we, or we discovered the, the Möbius bend that was of, of course discovered by Möbius in the 19th century, but it helped us make an infinite, uh, um, structure. 
The next step, of course, was to make it spacious. So you have, if you have a floor, you also need to have a ceiling to be able to go in. This is what we did with lead. Um, this is a very small model. Um, and we were able to, to bend it in such a way that you have a continuous space. Um, it's actually floor becomes uh, ceiling and the other way around. But it's full of mistakes. It's not, it's not uh, well done, so to speak. And at that time, I remember a guy in, in Holland who was, uh, had an article in an NRC Handelsblad, Dutch newspaper, and he discovered a mistake in a, in a drawing by Leonardo da Vinci, which is the drawing you see there. And the, the point, uh, the lowest point, pointing uh, downwards, actually has four legs, and he discovered that it's impossible to, to finish this, this space or this uh, structure. It has to have three legs. So um, I thought, if this guy looks that good at spacious problems, let's, let's call him and, and try to see if he can help us make the landscape house better. He was very enthusiastic, and what, what he actually did is put the whole uh, structure in the computer in Rhino, and there, um, with Grasshopper, he made sort of a, a panel. Um, and every, every uh, piece of data in the building can be changed. And the difference between a, a usual, regular, traditional building is that, um, for example, if you, if you heighten the, the ceiling that's above you with the slide, the, the floor on which you stand is also thickening. Or if you incline the stairs, it means um, other things in the building will change. So this is actually the brain behind the building, um, which led to the next step, and this is a more um, feasible uh, architectural image where the facade is actually very uh, um, strict or, so to speak, simple, and the curves um, become a bit more complex, but it looks like it could be a building. Uh, of course, that's what, and what you do next is make a good rendering to, to see how it would look like. Um, and actually, this building only consists of two surfaces. You have the facade, which is glass. If you follow a complete round with your eyes, you start at the front, and next, time, next round you're at the back. And also with the ceiling, if you follow it with your eyes, next round you're, you're uh, on the floor. Um, and we took it from, from here. Uh, actually, the stairs were, uh, were a bit of a problem in the corner, but we were inspired by Escher. Um, coincidentally, coming from the same village in, uh, where I grew up, but uh, the man that's climbing the stairs, a bit of a homage to him, but the stairs uh, follow the, the floor, and you actually step onto the next floor uh, instead of making an autonomous um, structure inside this building. Of course, this needs some, some work, but it's, uh, it's the way we want to solve the problem. And then one more thing was, if you have this building, that's nice, but if you put it on, on the landscape uh, that it's uh, meant to be built at, um, of course you don't want to break up that landscape wh where you got the inspiration from. So the entrance will be underneath uh, where you see the cars driving in, so you come in from the, from the bottom. And this is actually the moment where we thought, okay, we're succeeded in, in, in actually making the building, the design, and with potato flour, we printed the whole structure without making a beginning or an ending. So with paper or lead, you still had to make this cut. And uh, here, th the complete structure is, is feasible. The stairs are in it. You can see the entrance and everything. But then this guy, who, the mathematician who helped us uh, solve the problem of, of the facades and everything, said, why not print the building at full scale? because he was already printing his art, which looks a bit like uh, Escher drawings, uh, with an Italian guy uh, in, in, uh, in Pisa, actually. You see him standing here on the right, Enrico Dini. Um, he's been working on a, on a 3D printer who actually prints concrete um, and is helping currently also the people of the Sagrada Familia to, to uh, print is really complex forms, and this is where I think the, the, the technique of 3D printing uh, comes in very beautifully and elegant, because the mold making is being skipped. You can actually directly make the shape that you want. Uh, this is what it looks like. Actually, it, um, the, the system of uh, a, a usual inkjet printer with paper and ink, but now you have 
sand or grinded rock, uh, which is in a printer six by five meter large, so you can stand inside the printer. And magnesium chloride is, uh, as a liquid is put on top um, of, the, um, of the sand, and this way it hardens out the, the shape that you want layer by layer. This is the, actually the second, um, uh, you could call this the printer 2.0, it's bigger. Um, and that's what happens with, uh, with the technique. It will improve, it's, it's very, uh, um, yeah, it's easy to be influenced by the weather, this, this printer still, but this is how it works. You actually take the printer to the location. And the beautiful thing is that you print with the, the material uh, that you find in situ. So if, if you go to uh, Dubai, for example, you print with the sand that you find there and the facade or the floor will have the same look uh, as the material that you find there because this uh, magnesium chloride will, will harden out any, any sort of ground. Uh, this is a, a scheme that where you see the landscape house from the top and um, the square is actually the, the printer that you just saw. Um, it would be best to make it go around because then we print it in one go as we did with the little uh, model so you have actually no beginning or ending. But the moment we went public recently, uh, we, the, um, the, um, yeah, the way that we wanted to do it was to print from bottom to top and then two floors high and then actually move the printer. I thought it was impressive enough to, uh, to share uh, the project and, and see uh, if we can find the clients uh, by, by publishing. Um, here you see a detail uh, of, of one turn, um, and I'm showing it just to uh, share that there are two important com components, and one is the printed parts, the floor and the ceiling, but you also need the more traditional techniques uh, like uh, the glass and the, and the steel. And the, and the steel in the facade actually is very useful to, to make the large pans and have the whole Möbius strip being uh, very stiff in itself. Um, this is what the, the pieces look like, for example, use this, these are art pieces, but um, comparable to what we're going to do. And the advantage is that you can actually, inside of these uh, uh, pieces, leave space for installation or, or steel structure. A uh, kitchen block can come out of the floor. Um, the stairs can be printed in one go. Um, so it's, um, that's the, the printed parts. And for the construction of the complete uh, building, we found the German company Bollinger Grohmann, who helped uh, engineer this Sanal uh, Rolex Learning Center in Switzerland to, to make the combination of, of facade and, and floor. So this is not the building that we made, but by, it's by the Japanese architect Sana. Uh, an amazing building. Um, but actually, when you, all these techniques come together, this is what the... Uh, the outcome is, and uh, building like nature, no end, no beginning. You see the entrance, and uh, we, uh, we put in the, the thinker by Rodin to, to tickle maybe Carlos Slim to, uh, to buy it and uh, present his uh, Rodin sculptures. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, that is very impressive. Do you have a spot picked out already where it will stand? Well, like I said, the, the publications are helping right. a little bit, and right. there, is, there is contact with a, with a party in Brazil and one in okay. Dubai. Yeah, so. okay. But uh, it's being worked on. It sounds <laughs> like likely places. Yeah. And just so I get this right, parts of the Sagrada Familia are being 3D printed as we speak? Well, yeah, there are. Well, I don't know if he will help finish the whole thing, because right. I think it's a touristic attraction to not finish it. Right. But um, I think is well. What he did, he he printed parts, uh, and to help discover how Gaudi was thinking when he constructed them. So um, I'm not exactly sure how he will right. make it look like. Fair enough. Uh, well. And so you started out with an inspiration from from nature, but very quickly this moved into almost an inspiration or a solution that was inspired more by abstract physics and abstract math. Can you just explore briefly on how that transition works, how the process works? Well, as, as I showed in the introduction, like the question-answer discovery is, is really the way it works. And the question is, is 
is really about something that, that binds us all, like the continuity of things, and, and the discovery takes four, five, six, seven, maybe more years, and, and all these steps you don't know ahead, but right. uh, that's, that's how it goes. Okay, then yeah. last question. Once you finish the building, let's assume that's gonna happen very soon now. Mm -hmm. uh, what's gonna be the next big challenges and next projects you wanna tackle after? Well, there are a few projects, um, and one, one, is a f one is a film with a sort of a double reality, and the other one is a, a building in which um, the, the actual functions are in the floors and in the walls instead of in the, in, in the space within, so. Right. But let's, let's uh, construct the floating bed in this one first. <laughs> Fair enough. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you.